Good Sunday morning. This is Pastor Ezekiel Johnson of Great Commission Pentecostal Church. And uh, come, I'm coming to you today uh, with a word of encouragement and just following on with the little series that we started, why I believe that Acts 2.38 is God's plan for the salvation of man. Now, in the first two reasons that I gave, this is the third reason, the first two reasons I gave, the first one was the foundational marker put on by Jesus, laid down by Jesus. Hi, Sister Annie Streams. Good to see you this morning. Uh, the first foundation mark, foundational marker was put by Jesus when he said uh, to Nicodemus that except he made the exclusivity. Some people like to think there's multiple ways to God. But Jesus was very clear, very clear and unambiguous when he said that you must be born again. And then, of course, he defined born again as being born of water and of spirit. The second uh, reason that I gave was the man that Jesus chose to give the message. How he was, there's, there's four things I gave. Um, they're basically an acronym, ACTS. He was authorized in Matthew 16 by Jesus. And then he was also called by Jesus in uh, John 21, when Jesus told him to feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? After he'd made that horrific mistake, of course, of denying Jesus prior to his crucifixion. And then today that brings us to the third, um, or actually let me finish that thought. Then he was also told uh, in, in uh, Matthew 28, 19, Jesus has his disciples meet him on a mountain, an exclusive meeting, uh, just after his resurrection. And he tells them, of course, what we know as the Great Commission, Go, all powers given unto me in heaven and earth, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And, uh, of course, the last one is he was scripted. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts, and Luke is also the writer of the book that bears his name, Luke. In the 24th chapter, verse 47, Luke is, is um, recording the words of Jesus, but he has Jesus prophesy about the very words that are going to be used, the gist of that message, if you will, uh, that Peter gives on the day of Pentecost, but really specifically the answer that he gives when he's asked the question after his sermon or partly through his sermon of what shall we do? And of course, uh, Luke 24, 47 says, and that repentance and that remission of sins should be preached in his name beginning in Jerusalem. And then we find in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter uses those same, um, you know, a, a, um, a derivative of both of those words to describe what they needed to do. He says, repent. So there's the repentance part. And be baptized, every one of you. And then he gives a reason for the baptism. It's very specific, very implicit. There's no room for, uh, for error in the answer that he gives. He says, the reason for the baptism, specifically in the name of Jesus, is for the remission or the forgiveness of sins. Here's the place where it is dealt with very explicitly by the person who's given the keys to the kingdom. So we see that in Luke, uh, he basically foretells of Jesus or of Peter, acts, Jesus foretells of Peter actually making this statement um, on the day of Pentecost. And Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So he basically foretells that he's going to state that. And so that's why my second reason is an acronym. He's for the man that Jesus called to be the one to be the spokesman on the day of Pentecost, it's, which is Peter. He was authorized, he was called, he was told, and he was scripted. Which brings us to today. The third reason why I believe that uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 is the plan of salvation, uh, God's plan for the salvation of man. Um, I'm going to handle this in four parts because I thought I could handle it in one, but the information is quite voluminous and I need to kind of break this down into each scene. 
And so I'll do that. I'm going to start with the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, and really, let me just put out the reason. The reason is simply this. The explicit examples that are duplicated on multiple occasions is the, my third reason. There's explicit examples. I mean, I mean, very detailed information about the scene, which you'll see here today, starting with this, uh, this first one, that you can almost recreate the scene. He's given us so much information about what's taken place. Let me go through those things, that, bit of, those, those, uh, that package of information that we're given. First one, in verse uh, 1 to 13, the scene is described in detail. Uh, the time of day is actually given. Uh, that this crowd, you know, uh, forms. Verse 15 lets us know it was the third hour of the day. Um, the reaction of the unwitting crowd, they didn't know what was going on. You see that, uh, what they're thinking, which is, that's, that's detail um, that we're given because Luke is the writer, but he's rehearsing what this crowd was feeling based on what they were saying and how they were acting. Uh, the languages that were spoken, uh, the gist of what was being prophesied by the people that were prophesying, you know, that were speaking in tongues. The Bible lets us know that they were saying, talking about the wondrous works of God. And then verse 14 says that uh, it shows us how Peter came to age. Jesus had called him to do this, and so he took the floor. He was a spokesperson. And then we see Peter's sermon uh, his quote of Joel and how he ties that in and interprets what Joel 2:28 through 32 actually says. And then Peter's accusation of the crowd. And then in verse 37, we see the crowd's contrition and the question that uh, emerged from that crowd because of what Peter had said and had accused them of. And uh, then we see Peter's Answer to their heartfelt cry in verse 38 and 39. Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of, sin, of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then in verse 39, he then comes back with something a little extra. He says, for this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So in his statement here, he's inclusive of whoever God's going to call. Now, let me just stop for a minute here. And let me go to the most popular uh, message of salvation that's misinterpreted, in my opinion, by many, many people. And that's Romans 10.9. Where in Romans 10.9 is there, there a far-reaching effect? Because most people in Christendom will readily agree to the fact that this is for the early church. This happened in the early church. They can't deny it. It's too detailed, too written out for anybody to deny it. But Peter inserts a statement here. This verse 39 makes it very difficult to shut this down or to just try to make this be for a certain period of time. Because you have to answer the question, is God still calling? And then when you go to Romans 10, 9, you ask, ask the question, is there something in that text that lets you know that this is going to endure forever? If, if we're just going to play along with them and say, yeah, this is the plan of salvation for now. First of all, when did it become? And then is there anything that makes it endure beyond the statement that's given? In Acts chapter 2, verse 39, we see this far-reaching effect of what Peter just said. He's answering their question, but in answering their question, he also throws in a monkey wrench for anybody trying to change it later on. He says this promise about being baptized in Jesus' name and God removing your sins, this is for you, your children, and for all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This is, my, this is part one of my third reason why I believe that Acts chapter 2 is God's plan for the salvation of man. There's, it's just too detailed. It's specific to the point. It's an example. I think if God uh, meant for salvation for him, he came, he set all this stuff up for salvation. He set it all up for after his death for this to take place. 
surely in his wisdom, he would make it so that we would be able to understand it without any question. There wouldn't be one person having one opinion, another person having another opinion. And the way you stop all of that is to give examples. And the book of Acts gives examples. Now, if we ignore those examples, it's just like people that lived with Jesus when he was there, uh, while he was walking the earth. A lot of people were there, but in plain sight, the ones that were reading the scriptures, the ones that were interpreting scripture, they missed him. He was doing the mighty things. And their biggest thing was, well, he doesn't quite line up to this. He's not supposed to be born He's in, in uh, Nazareth. He's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. If they would have checked the record, if they would have done some research, they would have found that Jesus answered every question about what he was supposed to be. And I challenge anybody that's looking at this today, or you'll look at it at some time in the future because it's going to stay up. I challenge you to look at what the Word of God says. Don't ignore this that's in plain sight because someday, whoever you believe, whoever's influencing your decision about God and about salvation, they're not going to stand before you. There'll be no lawyers in heaven. There'll be no advocates in heaven. There'll be nobody standing before Jesus for you. But you. And the question will be posed, why did you ignore this? This is my third, this is part one of my third reason. Um, I'll come back with a video tomorrow and give uh, the second part of my third reason. God bless you. This is Pastor Johnson saying let's stay in the book. Have a great day.